The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom, whom, whom shall I fear? Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for our time of praise and worship. And thank you, God, for anointing us to be in your presence today. And God, as we now move to the ministry of the word, we need, Lord, your anointing of our ears so we can hear what you're speaking to us, God. We have sung our songs. We have spoken our praise. But we need to hear from you, God. And so anoint our ears to hear. Anoint our lips to proclaim your truth. And anoint our hearts, God, to be receptive to your presence, to your power. Receptive to your purpose. Finding and unfolding, oh God, in our spirit. God, we pray that you will anoint this preaching moment and bless us. Lift us up to the place where we belong. And show us, lead us to the life that you intend for us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Make us doers of your word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful for our service of worship and our worship and praise team ministering on today. Thank God for you, for our worship experience. Our lesson has been read from Daniel chapter 5. I'm um, mindful of the fact that starting on next Sunday, which will be the first Sunday in December, uh, we will transition into Advent. And um, so I'm, I've been preaching most of this fall on the, the theme of prophets and kings. And we've looked at uh, different confrontations between prophets and kings. And it's going to carry over into Advent because when I was researching the uh, lesson for today in Daniel chapter 4, our subject for today is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. Now we know about Nebuchadnezzar's rage. We know about how he seized his siege where he seized Jerusalem, we, we know about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but Nebuchadnezzar also had a testimony. But uh, when I was researching this, I came across an Advent message uh, by the uh, famed biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann. Walter Brueggemann is an Old Testament uh, specialist. He's now in his 80s, so he's uh, retired, but he's still very active in and writing and, and giving uh, lectures uh, from the Old Testament. But I found an article that he wrote, The Non-Negotiable Price of Sanity. And um, so I'm going to include a couple of insights from, from Brueggemann. But Brueggemann was writing about Advent, and he said that you can't, if, if you're going to talk about Advent in a way that is contemporary and engaged in what's happening in the world, you have to look at the fact that Jesus comes into the world when Caesar Augustus sends out a, de a decree that all the world should be taxed. That's how he ends up in Bethlehem. That's why his mother is traveling when she ought to have been at home. And she's traveling. And, they, you know, the whole story about the manger and no room in the end, all of that's set up by Caesar. And see, we don't want to be political. But that's the way the Bible tells the story. We just, oh, it was Caesar, Caesar. Well, Caesar was the one that orchestrated all that. And the, when he dies, when Jesus dies, the people say, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. So Caesar is there from the beginning to the end. But Brueggemann is saying, in order to understand the relationship between Jesus and Caesar, you look at the Old Testament. And he sees the model confrontation between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel as an important key to understanding Advent. So we're going to start Advent next week, but I'm going to use this message to transition from prophets and kings uh, to the king of kings, which will be the focus of our attention from now 
through the Christmas holiday. The non-negotiable price of sanity was written uh, in 2004, which is 14 years ago, it was published. And it was a reflection on what pastors in the United States church might say about the political, economic, and military hegemony of the United States. And he says that as of 2004, that military political prominence of the United States was the unbridled superpower. The United States has established its dominance as the number one superpower in the world. And so what Brueggemann is saying is that the confrontation between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel is a model of truth speaking to power. And he argues that superpowers that imagine arrogant autonomy eventually self-destruct. And they self-destruct in insanity. And they recover sanity only by doxology. So Nebuchadnezzar's testimony in Daniel chapter 4 is that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of his own insanity. But when the dream came true, he recovered from his insanity by his discovery of doxology. And so, let's go to Daniel chapter 4. The entire chapter is a letter a communique, a tweet, if you will, to all the people of the earth. See, when you get on Twitter, you send that tweet out. It goes, to all, it goes all the way around the world. Well, they didn't have Twitter then, but they had letters. And so if you read the, that chapter, Daniel 4, it's a letter that Nebuchadnezzar addresses to all the people. And he tells his story, and his story begins and ends with praise of the Most High God. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a terrible dude. I mean, he's like, he took the people into exile, he burned down their city, he took the things, the holy things out of the temple. He is a terrible, horrible person, but his story... His letter, his communication, see, Nebuchadnezzar went through something. And when he went through something, his story takes him to another place from being a holy terror to being a holy leader. Chapter 4, verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar sent the following letter to the people of all nations and races on earth. See, when you're a superpower, you, you have influence over all the nations and all, everybody pays attention to what you say and what you do when you're a superpower. So he's the super ruler of a superpower. So he's sending this to all the people on the earth. Greetings to all of you. That's a nice way to start. I have the contemporary English version. Your Bible might not say that, but... Greetings to all of you. I am glad to tell about the wonderful miracles God Most High has done for me. This is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. His miracles are mighty and marvelous. He will rule forever and his kingdom will never end. I was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity when suddenly I had some horrifying dreams and visions. Then I commanded every wise man in Babylonia to appear in my court so they could explain the meaning of my dream. After they arrived, I told them my dream, but they were not able to say what it meant. Finally, a young man named Daniel came in, and I told him the dream. The holy gods had given him special powers, and I had renamed him 
Belteshazzar after my own God. In other words, Belteshazzar was his slave name. His real name was Daniel. But once he was taken captive, he was given a slave name, Belteshazzar. And so this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking now. I said, Belteshazzar, not only are you the wisest of all advisors and counselors, but the holy gods have given you special powers to solve the most difficult mysteries. So listen to what I dreamed and tell me what it means. In my sleep, I saw a very tall tree in the center of the world. It grew stronger and higher until it reached to heaven and could be seen from anywhere on earth. It was covered with leaves and heavy with fruit, enough for all nations. Wild animals enjoyed its shade. Birds nested in its branches. Let me put a little parenthesis before I read on. I want you to pay attention to this image of this tree. Because see, the tree is going to be this nation under his leadership. And I want you to see that the tree provides shelter for the whole world. It provides nurture for the whole world. It is not in denial of the decline in the climate. You know, we're, we live in a time where there's any time you, you see these terrible disasters, you see the hurricanes and the fires, and the government's, oh, no, no, there's no such thing as, no, the climate is fine, there's no such thing as global warming. But this, this dream that he has is of a tree that is bringing health and healing to the world, not just to people, but to the world. So I want you to see that it's a, it's a life-giving dream. All creatures on earth lived on its fruit. While I was in bed having this vision, a holy angel came down from heaven and shouted, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Make the animals leave its shade and send the birds flying from its branches. But leave its stump and roots in the ground. Surrounded by grass and held by chains of iron and bronze. Make sure that this ruler lives like the animals out in the open fields. Unprotected from the dew. Give him the mind of a wild animal for seven long years. This punishment is given at the command of the holy angels. It will show to all who live that God Most High controls all kingdoms and chooses for their rulers persons of humble birth. So that's that, the Nebuchadnezzar in the letter is saying what his dream was, the dream that he told to Daniel. And so Daniel is able to interpret that dream, and Daniel concludes his interpretation with a call to repentance, a call to praise, and a call to recovered prosperity. And so when Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he is speaking truth to power. So let's go on. Ch uh, chapter 4, verse 22. This is Daniel's interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this gigantic tree, and that the tree's going to get chopped down. So here's Daniel's interpretation. Your majesty, you are the tree, tall and strong. You have grown so great that you reach the sky, and your power extends over the whole world. While your majesty was watching, an angel came down from heaven and said, cut the tree down and destroy it, but leave the stump in the ground. Wrap a band of iron and bronze around it and leave it there in the field with the grass. Let the dew fall on this man and let him live there with the animals for seven years. This then is what it means. Your majesty. And this is what the supreme God has declared will happen to you. You will be driven away from human society and will live 
with wild animals. For seven years, you will eat grass like an ox and sleep in the open air where the dew will fall on you. Then you will admit, in other words, you won't even have sense enough to come in at night. You'll just be out in the night. And then when the morning comes around, the dew of the morning will be on your back. Then you will admit that the supreme God controls all human kingdoms and that he can give them to anyone he chooses. The angels ordered the stump to be left in the ground. This means that you will become king again when you acknowledge that God rules all the world. So then, your majesty, follow my advice. See, he gives the interpretation, but the interpretation comes with some advice. It comes with a lesson. Stop sinning. Do what is right and be merciful to the poor. Then you will continue to be prosperous. There were four things that Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar to do. See, Nebuchadnezzar one had the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar was one who sent for Daniel. But when Daniel came and interpreted the dream, he gave him the truth. He didn't, he was a little fearful. Daniel was a little fearful of speaking the truth, but he spoke the truth. Sometimes you have to speak the truth despite the fact that your knees are knocking. Despite the fact that the person you're speaking to might not appreciate what you're saying. And so Daniel told him to do four things. Number one, acknowledge that God rules the world. Okay, you got all this kingdom, you got all this glory, and can I say this? You're going to have to look this up. If you don't believe me, you have to look this up. Nebuchadnezzar was God's agent in the world. And so all those terrible things that Nebuchadnezzar did to Israel was at God's direction. Because God was like, you know what? These are my people. I cannot get y'all's attention. Y'all will not obey me. Y'all keep worshiping these other gods. So I'm going to send somebody who's going to be time enough for you. And so God had sent Nebuchadnezzar and allowed Nebuchadnezzar to do what he did. But God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, you got to recognize you don't rule the world. I do. So the first thing, acknowledge that God, the supreme God, rules the world. And then number two, so simple, stop sinning. Unfortunately, sometimes when people get a lot of power, they think that they can do no wrong. They think that power corrects their errors. They think that they can always get people to cover for them, lie for them. And sometimes they can't. But there's no, there's no substitute for you deciding that you're going to stop committing your own sin. And so he told Nebuchadnezzar, stop sinning. And then number three, do what is right. It's a difference between stop sinning and do what is right. You need to do both of them. Stop sinning means stop doing what's wrong. And then start doing what's right. Okay. Stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right. And then the fourth thing he tells Nebuchadnezzar to do is have mercy on the poor. Part of his program of exile, invasion, siege, allowed him to just trample on the oppressed and the poor people. And God is saying, you're supposed to have mercy, you're supposed to have kindness, you're supposed to have compassion on oppressed people. Don't mistreat them because they're my people. And so that's kind of complicated, isn't it? That God sent him on a mission and God expected him to be merciful. But I just want to tell you that any mission that the Lord sends you on, don't forget to be merciful. 
Don't get so full of your mission or your commission that you become merciless and that you fail to have compassion for people who don't get it or who don't have anything or who don't have the same choices and opportunities that you have. And so he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, have mercy on the poor. As great as you are, and all this power you have. See, that tree had a whole lot going for it. That tree had all this fruit and all this leaves and all this shade and all of this grandeur. But don't forget to be merciful to the poor. Because God is always going to take care of the poor. And God is always, how's God going to do that? By that tree was not supposed to be exclusively for one class of people. It was not supposed to be exclusively for people. There were birds and there were wild animals. If, if there's a stewardship of the entire planet that is included in the greatness of this nation and of his rule. But how is a nation going to be great if they mistreat the poor? That's a biblical question. So... He got the interpretation of the dream, and he got the instruction what to do. But a year passed, and instead of doing what Daniel advised him to do, we see Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 4, I'm still in chapter 4, he's writing on, this is his testimony, so he's telling the story in his testimony. Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar walking around his palace penthouse, bragging about the magnificent power and glory of Babylon. So he had kind of forgotten what the dream was. He, he, I guess maybe he dreamed some other dreams, and he pushed that dream aside, and he didn't do what Daniel told him to do. So he's walking around his penthouse, looking over his kingdom, and just glorying in his power. And then all of a sudden his dream comes true. Verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. I, I said the roof. I call it a penthouse because if you'll notice one of the things that when, when people have a lot of money to put in the property, especially in the city, they like to build a rooftop thing. Sometimes they got swimming pools up there. But, you, I mean, you can just see it in this same neighborhood. If you look up, you see there's people put like a patio or they have cookouts and, like, you know, they enjoy themselves with their beverages and their other substances on the top, you know, because they're up from the street and they have a nice view. And so it's kind of a sign of affluence uh, to have this penthouse. You're not on the basement apartment, you're on the top, okay? So he's at the top of his game, walking on the roof of the royal palace. And the king said, is this not magnificent Babylon? which I have built as a royal capital by my mighty power and for my glorious majesty. Now he's used to people calling him his majesty. You ever met somebody calling him his majesty? But he's talking about his own glorious majesty. While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, O oh, king, Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, you, the kingdom has departed from you. This is, now this is not the voice of the prophet, and this is not the voice of angel. This is the voice of God. Okay? So you don't listen to the prophet, and you don't listen to the angel, and you don't listen to the dream. I don't know what to tell you if you got to hear the voice of God. But that's where Nebuchadnezzar, he He's at the place, he didn't listen to Daniel, didn't listen to the angel. So now you're going to hear the voice of God. You shall be driven away from human society. And your dwelling shall be with the animals of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like oxen. 
and seven times shall pass over you until you have learned, until you have learned, until you have learned that the Most High has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the sentence was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven away from human society. He ate grass like oxen. His body was bathed with the dew of heaven. And his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. And his nails became like bird's claws. He turned into an animal. Um, I don't know what to compare that to. But that's his testimony. That what he saw in the dream came to pass in his body. And so Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. And he began to live like an animal. But only for a season. The God who demanded mercy of Nebuchadnezzar showed mercy to Nebuchadnezzar. His testimony is that he got his mind back. He recovered his sanity when he lifted his eyes toward heaven in praise of Almighty God. And so the letter to the people ends with a doxology of praise. Acknowledging who God is and what God had done. So there's seven time periods, whether that's seven years or seven seasons, but it was seven periods of time. Verse 34, I'm still in chapter 4. At the end of seven time periods, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my mind came back to me. I thanked the Most High and I praised and honored the one who lives forever. Because his power lasts forever and his kingdom lasts from one generation to the next. Everyone who lives on earth is nothing compared to him. He does whatever he wishes with the army of heaven and with those who live on earth. There is no one who can oppose him or ask him, what are you doing? Just then, my mind came back to me. My royal honor and glory were also given back to me. My advisors and nobles wanted to meet with me again. See, nobody wanted to meet with him with claws and feathers and dew and, and, and lost his mind. They didn't even want to have anything to do with him. He's getting, oh, this is coming back. I was given back my kingdom and made extraordinarily great. Now I never could miss it will praise, honor, and give glory to the king of heaven. Everything he does is true. His ways are right. And he can humiliate those who act arrogantly. Notice that the period of time he suffered insanity was numbered by seven. That means it was commanded and ended by God. Because see, God operates in seven. Seven is the perfect number. So when you see seven, you pay attention. God commanded it, but God ended it. And Nebuchadnezzar learned some important lessons. Some of those lessons that he skipped the first time around, he learned them during the time when he was eating grass and had lost his mind. He learned how to give thanksgiving and praise to God and not to thank himself for what he has done. I, I heard of a world leader a few days ago sent a message out on Thanksgiving thanking himself for all the good job he has done. What kind of Thanksgiving is that? Thanksgiving, you're supposed to thank God. You don't thank yourself. You lost your mind if you thanking yourself on Thanksgiving. Thankful, full of thanks. But thank God, don't thank yourself. Let me get back to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar learned that God is able to restore what has been lost. And not just restore his mental health, 
but the honor and the authority and the relationships that he had lost. Everything that Nebuchadnezzar had lost, God restored it. Nebuchadnezzar was made great again. Extraordinarily great because he learned how God rules. And he learned how to follow God's rule with truth, with justice, and with a resistance to arrogance. See, arrogance is a big problem. When you are a leader, you ought to be humbled by the authority you're given, not made arrogant with it. Because your arrogance puts a negative edge on everything you say and everything you do. And so it, the, he, he, that experience eating the grass and having claws, that took the arrogance out of him. And so once he could put the arrogance aside, he could do the real greatness and the real thanksgiving. Brueggemann's comment, Truth and justice are exact alternatives to Nebuchadnezzar's arrogant practice of deception and exploitation. And we're familiar with both of those practices, deception and exploitation. Heaven help you if you live by deception. You tell so many lies that the only way you can function is by deceiving people. That is a terrible way to live, and it's a terrible way to rule. But that truth and justice, that's what God requires. That's what God wants. That's what God has ordained. And so that truth and justice is the thing that Nebuchadnezzar embraced after he was done with the arrogance and the deception, and the exploitation. The only way to release yourself from arrogance is to humble yourself. only way to release yourself from deception is to start telling the truth. And to release yourself from exploitation is to recognize that we must show mercy if we want to receive mercy. See, part of that deception, when you get to so much deception, you start to deceive yourself. And then you deceive yourself into thinking that you so you so all of that that you don't need forgiveness. You don't need mercy. But guess what? You need both of them. And so if you need mercy, you better show some mercy. If you need forgiveness, you better forgive others. And so that's how you re release yourself from exploitation by having some mercy and compassion for someone else. It is not difficult to see that American imperialism has gone insane. These are Brueggemann's words. Drunk with self-congratulatory power, intoxicated with self-regard, and out of touch with holy reality. Now, Brueggemann wrote that 14 years ago. And can I just say it's gotten worse since then? They are, these words are as relevant to our nation today as they were then. Our responsibility then as believers in the nation's capital is to speak truth to power. And not only speak the truth, but speak justice and speak mercy and speak humility. And where shall we speak it? To the White House, to the Congress, to the courts, to the agencies of government. So what's our responsibility? We read this story about Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not Nebuchadnezzar. You're not Nebuchadnezzar. But let me tell you, we've all been victimized. We all met Nebuchadnezzar. So what shall we do? How do we respond? What do we learn from Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible? That you better pay attention when God tries to send you a message. You better pay attention when God sends. See, the dream is a message. Now this morning, at the service this morning, uh, the brother preached about dreams, and he brought a nice poster of Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. And the people really enjoyed that message about dreams. And he said, you have a little dream or a big dream. But the dream in this, 
In this testimony, the dream was intended to send him a message. And he went so far as to get somebody, a man of God, to interpret the dream, tell him what to do, and then he still didn't do it. And then when God spoke to him, that's when everything that was in the dream came to pass. But God was merciful, and God restored him, and God made him great. And so Nebuchadnezzar, from that time on, his testimony ends in doxology. And if you've got a testimony, if you've recovered, if you've had gone through, you better have some praise at the end of your testimony. You better have some praise where you acknowledge God, where you say, this is how God brought me through. Some of us, we go through something and we're just mad at God. We're blaming God. We're questioning God. But even Nebuchadnezzar realized, you know what? I can't, ask, I can't question God. God has brought me through something. God has shown me something. God has, has used me as a leader, but God has restored me to the place where I can have an even bigger testimony because of what God has done. And so as believers, when we read stories like this, it should inspire us to be focused on our responsibility as a public witness for the Lord in this world. We ought to pray for justice and mercy and humility. We ought to preach justice and mercy and humility. We ought to practice. Some people are protesting and, and, and complaining, but they don't practice the thing that they're complaining about. So if you're going to pray for justice, practice justice. If you're going to preach mercy, you better practice mercy. And if you're going to acknowledge arrogance, you better learn some humility. We ought to promote justice and mercy and humility. What does the Lord require of our nation? Micah, the prophet, asked that question, answered the question for us in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? <clears throat> to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That was Micah's prophecy, but that prophecy suited Nebuchadnezzar's case. Now, if you read on to the next chapter, and I promise you next Sunday we're going to move into Advent, but if you read on in the next chapter, you will see that Nebuchadnezzar uh, did what he was supposed to do, but the next leader... And the next leader, the, the, his son and grandson, they went back to the same old arrogance, the same old exploitation, the same old deception, and then they saw the handwriting on the wall. Okay? Now, that's another sermon, and I won't start on that sermon, but let me just tell you, the handwriting on the wall is worse than the dream. Because when the handwriting got on the wall, it scared the people to death. When they saw the hand, when you see the hand, you don't want to see the hand of God writing on the wall. And so the people of God, the people of God, as the people of God, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to pray. Our responsibility is to preach. Our responsibility is to practice these things. Our responsibility is to promote these things and to let people know that we are not just some of us anyway. I mean, maybe some of you are pleased with the president and what he's doing and what he's saying, but I'm not. And it's not just a matter of protest. It's a matter of what does the Lord require of us? Let's live that way. Let's act that way so that when the ruthless man is gone, we can resume where we were. And we can vote some people in who will care about justice and care about truth and care about mercy and care about the poor and care about health care and all those things that have just gone out the window. I make no apology for a political message. But part of the reason we're in the predicament we're in now is the deception of the people of God. And so as people of God, we need to know the truth. We need to challenge one another what is the truth? I'm not saying everything I say is true. No, no. Let's challenge one another. Let's look in God's word. And let's ask the Lord, show us God. If you're going to send for the messenger, then do what the message says. Don't send for the messenger and then say, mm, that was interesting. I think I'll just go back to my penthouse. 
Because that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. They found himself in the field eating grass. But he recovered. And so can we. And so when we pray, when we pray for our president, I think about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came around, didn't he? He came around. And so whoever, whatever praying we're going to do, Capitol Hill, Supreme Court, White House, think about Nebuchadnezzar. If, if the Lord could bring him around, the Lord could bring anybody around. And don't just pray because you hate them. Don't just pray to, to get rid of them. Just pray for the Lord to fix them. Yes. Fix their mind. The Lord restored his mind. He had lost his mind. Some people lost their, everybody lost their mind is not in the mental hospital. But the problem with losing your mind and being in power is that other people lose their mind trying to figure out what you're doing. We want, the, we want that tree. I love that. That's the tree of life. We first meet that tree in the Garden of Eden. And guess what? The tree comes back in the book of Revelation. So that tree of life, that's this a beautiful organic image of the provision that God has made for the world. And so we don't want the tree to be chopped down. How do we keep that tree from being chopped down? By practicing truth. Speak truth to power. Practice justice. Do the right thing. And for God's sake, don't be arrogant, but walk humbly with our God. Because this is God's work. God's message is God's tree and God's world. And as the people of God, we are positioned to be used of God, to be the voice, to make a difference, and to bring the vision to pass. God, we thank you and we praise you for your word today. You are an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. And we thank you for Nebuchadnezzar's testimony because after all he did and all he went through, God, you restored him. We are in a regime now that brags about making America great again. But God, you're the only one who can do that for real. You're the one who can make us great. You're the one who can make us excel in justice, excel in truth, excel in humility, excel in unity. And so God, we ask that you will hear our prayer for these things, that you will use us as instruments of peace and justice in this world, not with arrogance, not with deception, not with an intent to exploit and oppress, but God with mercy and justice as our portion, as what we offer, as how we thrive and how we flourish. God, we pray, restore the tree in all of its leaves for healing and its fruit of prosperity. God, we pray that you will fix our nation Make our nation great again, not based on hatred and racism and deceit, yes. but make our make nation great based on your truth and your justice and show us how to treat people right and, and to do something about the killing and the hatred and the discrimination. God, we pray that you will cleanse your people. Start with your church and help the church to have a credible witness to the world yeah. because we practice these things, because we promote these things, because we expect these things of one another. And Lord, we just pray. The Bible warns us that the very elect would be deceived. We ask God that you will lift the deception off of the minds of Christians and help us to discern your truth, your direction, your path, your action. Because we belong to you and we know that you are in charge. This is your world and we are your royal subjects. Prosper us to your purpose, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we sing, our God is an awesome God. Just this little chorus. 
is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with a wind. 